So tonight, again, we are uh, continuing in our, our study here on the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, week six. Uh, Acts, to, to, here's my plan for the night. This is my goal. Is chapter, I, went, I did what I said I did last week. Now, come on. Uh, chapter four, verse uh, 32, we're gonna, I'm going to attempt to get to chapter five, verse 16 is the goal tonight, okay? And then here is your title for tonight. What's mine is fill in the blank, okay? So I'll explain that in a minute if you want to write that down because I'm getting ready to start into verse 32. But this is the title for tonight. What's mine is fill in the blank, okay? All right, let's get into the word. Now, wait, we need a recap. We need a recap. Make sure we're on the same page. Is this, I'm, my recaps are getting shorter and shorter each week, okay? So if you remember... Starting in Acts chapter 1, <clears throat> Jesus had not ascended to heaven yet, but he spoke. One of his last things he said was, hey, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come give you power so you guys can be witnesses, right? Jesus ascended to heaven. Holy Spirit came down in chapter 2. People thought they were crazy. Peter stood up and started preaching, right? Um, and then they healed a man who had been lame. He was healed. Then he had preached some more after that. And then they got in trouble, had to go to the council, Right? The Sadducees, remember that? Um, and then um, he preached to them, and then uh, they prayed for boldness at the very end. Y'all remember that, kind of how we ended uh, last week? We were on the same page? Okay, so here we go. They prayed for boldness. They want God to do more miracles so they could preach more and they can have more persecution and build the church. Sounds like the church, amen? Amen? All right, so here we go. Chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Now, check it out. United in heart and mind. All of them were united. Now, again, we talked about this Sunday. I'm going to say it again. When it comes to the church, it's not about conformity. It's about unity. Unity, unity does not mean that we're all the same. Unity means we gather around some things that are same, that are very important to us, right? Okay? So there's unity with the believers. Why is that important? Why is that important that we're reading that here in chapter 4? If you guys remember in John 17, what was Jesus? He said, I, what, I, what did Jesus say he, he wanted to pray about? That we would, be, we would be unified. That if we're unified as the body of Christ... It'll be a testimony to everybody else who's not a believer that we, we are actually the body of Christ and that Jesus is the Messiah, right? So this is, this is an extremely important verse right here. They were all, all of them were united in one mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. They shared everything they had. Now, remember again, there's a big difference between stewardship and ownership, so this, this, this concept for them to share everything they have is because they, they knew they were stewards of what God put in their hands. If they were owners of those things, they'd probably be stingy and not share it. That's my stuff, right? But this is God. God has given us all of this, so we share all those things. And that's why they were generous. They were all united, and they were also all generous. So again, it, it helps us understand that what we need to focus on is our standard of giving, not our standard of living. And so your standard of living will be different than somebody else out there if you're a Christian. Because your standard of giving is going to be different. Right? Right? You operate on 90% or maybe 85% or maybe 80% or whatever it is. It's going to be different because your standard of giving is different. So your standard of living might look a little different. Amen? Yeah. And so when, even when I say that, this attacks our culture. Do you know that? Like three main things that, that attacks our culture is consumerism, materialism, and individualism. Consumerism is people that they just want more things. Like, and and, and they, wanna, they, they make those things that they have their identity. That's consumerism, right? So basically, a person who has a consumerist like mindset, they buy their identity, right? So their car and their job, you know, their house and etc. Materialism, if you go down to that one, materialism is I buy things to make me happy. So I'm not happy unless I have X. 
or I, I need this kind of car, I need this kind of clothes, I need this, you know, whatever. Individualism is that I don't need anybody. I don't need any help, right? And we all know that isolation is a bad place to be. And we're not talking about being completely dependent where you don't do anything, but there needs to be an interdependence when it comes to the body of Christ. And that's what we see here. They're united in heart and they share everything that they have. That's unity. Verse 33, the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. Okay, notice, they testified powerfully. Why and how did they testify powerfully? They were able to have a powerful testimony about who Jesus is because of the verse before. They were unified together, right, in one accord, not a Honda. They were all together, one heart, one mind, and then they were able to testify powerfully, right? So that's what happens when a church is in one accord. They're unified together. That's when the services get really powerful, when we're, when we're unified, when there's not a lot of divas in the room. Well, I don't like that song. I don't like this carpet. I don't like this, you know, da, da, da. That, that, that's division. Unity is that we're here to worship, right? And we're able to testify powerfully. And God's great blessing was upon them all. Why was God's blessing on them all? Because they testified to the power of the resurrection, right? And so as long as our message and the central theme of our message is the resurrection of Jesus, there'll be a blessing that comes behind that, right? Anytime you try to water down the word, no blessing. Anytime you try to lower the bar, no blessing, no blessing. Verse 34, there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. So there was no one who had any needs among them because they were so generous. They were extravagantly generous. This is an example for us today as the church. If you want to say, hey, we should be like the church in Acts. Well, up your standard of giving. No one had a need in the church. I want to be like the, we need to be, Pastor Justin, we need to be more like the book of Acts. I will tell you this. If we want to be more like the book of Acts, you need to understand the grace that you've been given. And when you understand the grace and forgiveness you've been given, you become generous. It's the people who are stingy, they don't understand the grace they've been given, right? Let me put it this way. If... If somebody gives 0%, let's just say someone gives 0% to the church and they call themselves a Christian, I would say it's almost 100% they're not a Christian. Let me say that again. If you give 100%, you're a Christian. But if you give 0%, there's a 100% chance you're probably not a Christian. Does that make sense? When it comes to generosity, right? There's a difference between ownership and stewardship. So there's four mindsets of giving. This goes to my title of the message here. I'm going to fill in the blank for you. You have four options here. What's mine is mine. That's one option you have. This is someone who's stingy, who doesn't want to give anything, right? Still want to be called a Christian, but you just want to keep it all to yourself. What's mine is mine. It's my money. It's my car. It's my house. It's my life, my career, right? Let me share a couple of stats with you that I just saw recently. 13% of millennials, okay? 13% of millennials give something to some kind of charity, which would include churches. 13% of all millennials give something. Guess what Generation Z is, the one underneath them? 6%. Now, before you start judging them, they learned that from somebody, yeah, right. right? Or they didn't get taught properly from somebody, okay? So they, getting, they, they got taught what's yours is yours, what's mine is mine, okay? So we got to change that. What about the second one? What's yours is mine. What's, your, what's yours is mine, right? This is a stealing mindset, right? A scarcity mindset. 
that I can't celebrate what you got going on because I need more. And what you, it's not fair that you got what you have. I need that. So what yours should be mine, right? Here's a third one. What's yours is everyone's. This is socialism, which I've talked about for a couple Wednesdays in a row. I will not belabor it anymore. You can go on YouTube and watch it. If you want me to go on a tangent again about it, you don't want me to do that tonight. Socialism doesn't work, and it's not biblical. And so what happens is if you think is what, what's, what's, what's yours is everybody's, that you should just give, you should give yours to everybody, not me, is what happens is you, you're basically someone who just judges other people. You're always looking at the other person who might have more money than you go, well, they should give more. They should give more, right? But the fourth one is really what our mindset should be is this one. What's mine is God's. What, what's mine is actually God. It's not even really mine. I'm just using that as a label. It's, it's mine, but it's really not mine. It's his, right? And so therefore, if it's not mine, if he owns it, my job is to steward it. What is stewardship? You guys remember we talked about this. It's management. Stewardship is overseeing and maximizing a return on what someone's given you. So whatever God has given you, you are to oversee it and maximize it. So God might have given you some kind of resource. You are to oversee it and then maximize it. God might have given you children. You're to oversee them and maximize their potential, right? Whatever God has given you, you are to oversee that and maximize it. It's not yours, it's his, right? So it's stewardship and generosity is what we see in the early church. And we should be seeing it today in the church today. Stewardship and generosity, they go together. It's one thing to manage it, but it's another thing to give it back out. Some people like to manage it and just keep it. I manage it, I oversee it, and then it's my job to give it back out. And if you're not a good steward and you're not generous, it's a heart issue. You have to ask yourself this question. Am I, con- am I a consumer or a contributor? Am I someone who just shows up and I want it all to come to me? Or am I somebody who shows up and says, what can I do to build God's kingdom? Let, let, let me just tell you all this. This, this will help you out. This will help you out. You might know this. I'm just going to tell you. Um, you're going to die one day. Uh, if you didn't know that, I'm just letting you know. It's going to happen one of these days. I don't know when. You don't know when. But it, and guess what? All the stuff that you have, somebody else is going to own. Like, I was thinking about this when I was in the, the house the other day. I was like, somebody else is actually going to live here in my, in my bedroom one day. I was looking at my golf clubs. Like, somebody else is going to hit these one day. Probably I left a lot of good shots in there. Someone else is going to get all the good shots. Yeah. But everything that you own is either going to be destroyed or used by somebody else one day. Yeah. Everything you own is going to be thrown away or go to an antique store one day. Or maybe a garage sale. I don't know, right? So that's why, as stewards, we have to understand our priority is to give to those in need. Was the apostles, to give to those in need. They gave to the apostles to give to those in need. That's why when we come to the church, we tithe and we have our ROI, our Reach One initiative. We tithe and we have our Reach One initiative to give to those in need. And what are we supposed to give? I'm not going to go into a big, long sermon about tithing. But it's the principle of the first. We seek first the kingdom of God. And we give him first of everything, everything, everything. Because he's first. Let me give you something practical when it comes to giving. Three questions. Is being generous in giving, is it a priority for you and your family? And if it is, do you have a percentage that you say you want to give? And if you do have a percentage, is it progressive? What do I mean by that? Number one, if giving's not a priority, the rest of those don't matter. Because you don't, you're not even talking about percentage. If giving's a priority, you, you should have some kind of percentage that we want to give this year. That's my goal. But then thirdly, is it progressive? Do you want to try to beat that next year? So if you give 10% this year, can you do 11 next year? If you give 11 that year, can you give 12 the next year? Whatever the numbers are for you. you that's between your family. You pray about it, whatever. You need to, it needs to be a priority that your giving should be. It needs to be a percentage. It'll help you out, stay, give you some accountability, and be progressive. Challenge yourself. Ask God to provide more for you so you can provide more for those that are in need. Let me also say this. 
I don't know how much money you make, but I'm going to use, a, I'm going to use an easy number. Um, if you'll be generous with $30,000, you'll be generous, generous at $100,000. If you're generous at $100,000, you'll be generous at $300,000. But if you're not generous at $30,000, you will certainly not be generous at $300,000. Okay? All right, let's move on. Verse 36. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Pause for a minute. Uh, I just want to throw in a little something for my uh, Bible dorks like me. Because some of you might go, now wait a minute, he's from the tribe of Levi. Levi. The Le- the, those from the tribe of Levi, they were not supposed to be owning any land. Like, well, how's he doing that? But it says he's from Cyprus. He, he came from Cyprus, okay, from the island of Cyprus. So he might have owned some land over there. So that, that, that's okay. He didn't own any, any land in Jerusalem. So it was over in Cyprus, okay? So, but the encouragement, though, he encouraged. How did he encourage? He encouraged them through his finances, through being generous. Anybody in here ever been encouraged because you've seen somebody's faith and their generosity? Yeah, certainly have. Amen. I have seen people early on in my early, when I was following Jesus, early in my walk, they were extremely generous financially that really encouraged me to be generous financially, right? Also, I want you to know this. Generosity is contagious, but so is stinginess. So who are you hanging around? Are you hanging around people that are stingy with their money? Guess what? You'll be stingy too. Are you hanging around people that are extremely generous? It'll start rubbing off on you. You realize this isn't my money anyways. It's God's money. I'll put it to you this way. The early church wasn't mandated by the law to give. They were motivated by the heart. Motivated by the heart. Okay. So chapter four. That was the end of chapter four. Now, before I get into chapter five, I'm going to give you a little warning before we get into chapter five. Up to this point, we have seen God add to the church and we've seen God multiply the church. Have we not? Right? 120, 3,000, 3,000, 5,000, right? And that's just counting men. So there's probably a whole lot more than that. But now we're going to see subtraction happen in chapter five. Point to be made here. God will add. God will multiply. Sometimes he'll subtract, but he won't divide. God doesn't divide, okay? Notice that when we we go through through all of Acts. Okay, little joke here. Ready for a joke? So what we're going to see happen, (laughs) how many people have heard the term slain in the spirit? Yeah. Okay, now we're going to see slain by the spirit, like as you're literally getting ready to happen right now. Some of you know your Bibles, you're you're laughing because you know what's getting ready to happen here. Chapter 5, chapter 5. So we're getting ready to see the third miracle in the book of Acts. It's getting ready to happen, okay? Here we go. Chapter 5, verse 1. But there was a certain man named Ananias who was with his wife, Sapphira. They sold some some property. Now, before we get into the next verse, they sold some property they probably sold the property um, because they saw the applause that Barnabas got of selling his property, right? He was the encouragement. He sold his property. They probably saw the applause. They probably saw what he did, and they sold their property. Verse 2, he brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Pause. Okay, with his wife's consent. It's obvious they were on the same page. In a marriage, generally speaking, it's good to be on the same page. But if one of you is on the wrong page, it's not good to be on the wrong page, both of you, okay? Just know that. (laughs) Why were they on the wrong page? Because he brought part of the money and claimed that it was the full amount, Now, when it says, again, he he brought part of it, he claimed it was the full amount, there's a Greek word there. I'm not going to try to say this word because I honestly don't even know how to say this word, Uh, but this is the Greek word here, and it literally means to steal. That's what it means. It's used other places in the New Testament to mean steal. 
So by him holding it back, or you, maybe your, your Bible says kept back, if the translation you have, he kept it back, meaning he stole it. So here's three quick things about this. Their problem was with dishonesty, not generosity. It was dishonesty. They gave a portion, which is okay to give a portion, but they implied that they gave it all, so they lied. So in generally speaking about dishonesty, dishonesty is a terrible thing, but we can use it oftentimes when we're dishonest, we're using it to cover something up. Cover up our greed, lust, jealousy, anger, shame, fear, just to name a few. The truth is this, lying lets sin live. When you're lying, you're allowing sin to breathe and stay with you. So dishonesty allows sin to keep on whatever it's doing in your life. It stays there when you're being dishonest because you're covering something up. Number two, their problem was also a lack of faith. So it was dishonesty, but it's also a lack of faith. They didn't trust God. They didn't trust him. They didn't want to give all of it, but also they lied about it. Why did they lie about it? Because they wanted to use God to make themselves look good. That's taking God's name in vain. Some of you think that's just when you just like say his name, but anytime you use the name of God to try to benefit yourself, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. That's the third commandment, okay? I'll put it to you this way. A lack of faith is birthed in isolation and grows into compartmentalization. So when you have a lack of faith, it's usually when you're by yourself, you don't, nobody's around, you don't think it's a big deal, you'll talk yourself into doing something. And then what it ends up growing into is you start to push God over in this box over here. I kind of got my God box over here. I got my career over here. I got this over here. And so you start to think again, this is, this is my box over here, God. This is my stuff over here. You're kind of over there, right? And it all comes from a lack of faith and living in isolation from a dishonest heart. Third thing, their problem was a heart issue. It was a heart issue. It wasn't a money issue. It was a heart issue. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said this, wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will also be. Now, this next quote I have here, I don't even know who said this. I heard this a long time ago, and I've never known who said it. So whoever said it, you're awesome. Um, but I like this quote. Uh, Once the love of money sets in, there is no evil a person can't do. So they, they held some back. They lied about it. Okay. Then, verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias why have you let Satan fill your heart? Now, notice here, you let, you let Satan fill your heart. So Satan filling his heart was a choice. He allowed Satan to fill his heart, right? Here's an example. His name is Judas. He allowed Satan to fill his heart. Right? So it's a choice. Now, again, Peter said this. So Peter said, why have you let Satan fill your heart? I think this is an example of what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. I believe this is a word of knowledge. So Peter got a word from the Lord and looked at him and said, Satan has filled your heart. Right? He continues on. You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. <laughs> the property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished, and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And this must have crushed Ananias. He's probably expecting that everybody's going to praise him and applaud him publicly. But when you di you're dishonest, you dishonor God publicly, you're going to be called out publicly. 
And he, notice he says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You weren't lying to us, but you lied to God. Right? So again, here's a point. The Holy Spirit is God. You see that? You lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God. Again, with Jesus, there are three in one. And notice also, you didn't lie to the church. You lied to God. The property was yours to sell or not. I want you to know this. God doesn't need our money. Here's the point. He doesn't need your money. The crime really wasn't withholding money. It was being deceptive and lying about it. Right? So what we see happening is greed and pride happen at the same time. It's a terrible combo. Greed and pride. Let me put it this way. It's easy to be happy with the image of spirituality without the reality of spiritual life. It's easy to be happy with creating an image in front of other people so they'll applaud you. But under the surface, you don't really have any substance. So after selling, it says again, after selling, the money was yours to give away. What's the point here? The sin that you committed wasn't necessary. You didn't have to do this. You chose to do this. How could you do this? How could you do a thing like this, Peter said? Listen, Satan can use deception, but he can't make you sin. Notice again, Peter said, how could you do a thing like this? Not how could Satan do a thing like this? How could you do a thing like this? You did this. I want you to know this, too, when it comes to fear. Most people's fear is about being found out in anything. Now, verse 5, here we go. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Now, again, notice, he died. He didn't die by Peter. Peter is probably more surprised than anybody. Like, he's just telling him, just calling him out. Like, hey, and boom, dude just dropped. Like, whoa, what happened? We're not sure exactly what happened. The text doesn't tell us exactly. I don't know. Um, out of shock or terror or fear, if you had a heart attack, we don't, we don't really know what happened right here. But I do know this. When I look at the text, Ananias didn't argue and didn't debate. He didn't. He didn't say, no, wait a minute. No, that's not true. That's not true. He's like, yep, Guilty. Here's the truth I want to point out to us. We don't know how much time we have. Like, you really don't. You don't know how much time you have. I don't know how much time I have. So what's the point of that? Repent. You better get to repenting. Why wait? Don't be dishonest. Don't live a life in fear, hiding your sin. Repent. Repent. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. We move towards holiness and purity and right living when we fear God. Repentance comes after you decide to have the right kind of fear. Not fear man, but fear God. And I want you to also notice this. God can take any terrible situation and turn around and use it for good. This is a terrible situation, right? And he used this situation to communicate something. It was a drastic measure, but it happened. I, and I know this, is, this one's a tough one to read. I mean, it's like, wow, I can't believe like that. Wow, it happened. Um, but I also know this. Uh, that there are many churches today that have watered down the word and they're basically dead, laying dead. And God will allow that to happen. It's the dead, lifeless church, right? It's a church on a sign, but it's not really a church, right? So what the church needs to stay alive is to repent. Repent. I'm going to get that here in just a minute. I'm not even done with that yet. Repent. Be honest. Don't hide things. And through repentance, we have salvation and sanctification, right? All right, let's move on. 
Continuing on the same verse. Everyone who heard about it was what? Terrified. Wouldn't you be? (laughs) Terrified. But I know this. The fear of God leads to purity. The fear of God leads to purity. And then notice this. The church pure is the church powerful. When the church is pure, ooh, the church is powerful and can move mountains. It doesn't mean we're going to be sinless, but it does mean the more we fear God, we sin less, okay? I want you to know this too. Revival and great moves of God come after waves of repentance. Every time you look in church history, when there was a big revival that would move, people getting saved, delivered, and healed, it always comes after waves of repentance, that people have a revelation that they need to repent and stop hiding and stop being dishonest, right? In verse six, oh, the joke alert. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. This was the first youth group. Anyway. <laughs> That's pretty good, wasn't it? That's pretty good. It was okay. Kind of dad jokeish, but it was, you know. Anyway, verse 7. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for the land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. <laughs> One point before I go to the next verse here. The concept of submission in marriage does not extend to submitting into, into sin. Okay? So, like, if, if my wife wanted me to sin, I'm like, well, I got to submit to my wife, like the word says. Like, I mean, look, no. Same thing, wives. If your husband's wanting you to sin, I got to submit to, no. Remember, we obey God first, right? Verse 10, instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Busy night for the youth group. (laughs) Quick note here. The first two funerals in the Christian church were by hypocrites. The first two funerals in the church were not two saints that they stayed, persevered, and they gave their life for the Lord. Like, no, they were hypocrites. What's the point? Stop pretending and start repenting. Right? Right? Here's your warning. Just like these two, we lie to ourselves first, and then we'll lie to other people. Right? You'll lie to yourself first. You'll justify it. And then you'll feel okay going and lying to somebody else. I don't need counseling. Our marriage doesn't need counseling. I I don't need help in my budget. I don't need help with my finances. You know, I don't need that. I don't don't need any help with this lust that I have. I don't don't need help, the fact that I'm still addicted to porn after all these years. I don't need any help with that, right? So you'll tell yourself that stuff by yourself. And then you'll tell it to somebody else who tries to say, hey, let me help you out. I don't need any help. I don't need help. What are you talking about? Now, verse 11. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Fear gripped the entire church. That's a good thing. Because the fear of God leads to holiness. The fear of God leads to sanctification. The right fear of God leads to accepting correction from God and submitting your will to God, right? And the wrong fear of God leads leads to an unbalanced life where you have an unbalanced view of who God is. You don't realize that he is both a tender father and a tough judge at the same time. Too many people swing to one side or the other. He's, he's a tender father, so I can just sin and do what I want, and he'll forgive me later, right? No. Or he's just a tough judge. Like, he's just mean all the time. He doesn't, but if you think that, you, you won't realize that God wants a relationship with you. 
He's a tender father and a tough judge. At, he's lion and lamb, right? And listen, let's be honest for a second. When you and I sin, we don't have a healthy fear of the Lord, right? When we sin, we do not fear the Lord. We have walked into a fear of man. How many people remember the phrase that your mom said, wait till your dad gets home? <coughs> right? You remember that. <laughs> what did that mean? There's going to be consequences. And so when we have a fear of the Lord, it'll stop you in your tracks. You go, wait a minute. There's consequences to this. Right? So it's your choice. You can repent and draw close to God every single day, or you can learn through painful consequences. You can learn one way or the other. You can learn from correction from the Lord by walking with him, or you can learn by consequences of your sin. It's your choice. It's less painful to have a healthy fear of the Lord. All right, last few verses here, verse 12. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. Many miraculous signs and wonders. Do you notice what just happened here? Did you see what just happened? God answered their prayer. You remember they prayed about this? Lord, do more signs and wonders. Because we want to preach the word. And so God started doing more signs and wonders. The miracle and the message always go together. Again, verse 12, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade or Solomon's Porch. They were meeting regularly. Let me just say something. That's a miracle in and of itself, for the church was all meeting regularly after such a tragic thing had happened, right? But the unity shows again the testimony of the believers. And they were meeting at the temple. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, uh, but the early believers didn't really see Christianity like this completely separate thing from Judaism. They saw it as a continuation as Judaism. Like it was the fulfillment. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the scriptures. So of course they would go to the temple, but also they wanted to go to the temple to talk about Jesus to all these people so they can know everything that you're reading about, that's all about Jesus, right? Now also, I want you to know, they met at uh, Solomon's porch here. Um, this is in the public so the church met, they went out in the public. So the church was not a secret club. The point is, you can't say, I have a private faith. It's just me and Jesus, right? Like, no, it don't work that way. Verse 13, but no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. So no one else dared to join them. What's that mean? That means this is a good thing because it kept out casual consumer Christians. And sometimes God will bring a miracle and a move to sift out those that are just consumer Christians. They're not really Christians. They're Christians by title, right? We saw what happened through COVID, right? A lot of people bowed down. They, they said they believed one thing, but they didn't really actually believe it. They had high regard for them. Why, what does that mean? They knew that the Christians had a high level of integrity. By the way, that should be the, the opinion of non-believers of us all the time, right? Verse 14, yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. Now, wait a minute. It just said nobody else dared to join them, but this says yet more and more were believed. Is this a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction, right? The point is this, there were some people who didn't want to be a part of this because they were scared and they, they didn't know God. Then there was others who heard the gospel, their hearts were warm to the gospel, and they ran to the Lord. Jesus said this, I will build my church. I will build my church. Listen, it's okay that we pray that God would, 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 would bring the lost in. That's a great thing. It's, it's, we want God to do that. We want the lost to come in. But Jesus said he's going to build the church. So what we need to pray for is unity in the body of Christ. We need to pray for unity in the entire body of Christ. And see, when they came together and they went out in public, there were some people that are like, you yeah, know, I don't want some of that. I don't want any of that. And there's other people that hear the gospel and they would run to it. Jesus is building the church. 
Not everybody is going to say yes to the gospel. They're not. Don't get discouraged if you share, if you witness to somebody and they're like, oh, you're, guys, you're crazy. Not, every, not everybody's going to say yes. It's okay. Jesus is going to build the church, right? And listen, we are go- we're not going to make disciples by lowering the bar and say, okay, well, we, we, need, to, we, we need more people in the church. So um, let's just don't talk about sin. Um, let's don't talk about anything controversial. And let's water down things as much as possible. Let's just preach those verses that everybody likes, like Philippians 4.13. Like, just, just preach on that. Give them some self-help. You're not going to make any disciples doing that. So when you witness to somebody, don't water it down. The God who created everything and spoke it all in the motion loves me. He sent his son Jesus to die for me. He died on a cross and took my sin and my shame and put it up on that cross so that I could have freedom, right? Just tell them what the truth is. Don't, don't be afraid of the truth. Also, also notice this. This is so important. They were brought to the Lord. More and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Notice they weren't brought to a building. They weren't brought to a pastor. They weren't brought to hear a sermon. They were brought to the Lord. That's why at the church, when we bring people into the body of Christ to hear the gospel, the gospel must be preached, all of it, the full gospel, not part of it, not some of it, all of it. Yeah. And when we preach the gospel and we live it out and we're unified in the body of Christ, God adds to it and then God might subtract. Because some people don't want to hear the gospel. Because they're selfish. They want their own gospel they want to make up. Right? And God will subtract that. But God will add and build and multiply the body of Christ. Amen? Verse 15. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Now, a couple quick, quick notes here. Sick people were brought. People heard, people saw God healing through the apostles. So, of course, people are going to start to crowd around, just like they crowded around Jesus. People would come from all over to get around Jesus. Now they're hearing that these guys who were following Jesus, they were with Jesus. They were close to Jesus. God is healing people through them. So they started bringing people, bringing all these sick people. Now, again, it says Peter's shadow. Now, that is some power right there. Now, I want you to also know this. The text does not say that his shadow healed anybody, okay? It, didn't say, it doesn't say that, right? But I also want you to know this. In Luke chapter 8, there was a woman who busted through the crowd and reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' robe, just touched his garment. He just reached out and touched it. What did Jesus say in verse 48? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Notice Jesus didn't say, my robe made you well. Like if I would have wrote a, wore something different, it was not like I wore my bet. No, your faith, your faith. So really that's a statement when we're talking about Peter's shadow. It's more of a statement of their faith. That they had enough faith to even just get around. Like if we can just get in the vicinity where the Holy Spirit's at. You ever, have you ever done that? Where you know where the Holy Spirit's moving, you can get into the room and you're like, the Spirit is here right now. Woo! You can feel the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, we'll come to a close here. I made it. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. I feel like I need to read that again. Crowds, lots of people, came from villages all around Jerusalem. By the way, this is the first time it's mentioned that people came to the apostles from outside of Jerusalem. How many people remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, what are they supposed to do? They're, They're supposed to be witnesses, and they're supposed to go, right? They haven't gone yet. People are coming to them, 
It won't be until Acts chapter 8 that they actually go. But people are coming to them, okay, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Why? I don't know if you've noticed the theme here about the church. This is a church that is extremely generous, extremely unified together, and walking in purity. And God's moving. So if we want to see God move in a powerful way, if the equation is generosity, purity, integrity. You see that? Generosity, time, talent, treasure, giving all, it's not yours anyways. You're just being a steward. Your time's not even your time. Your talent's not your talent. Your treasure is not your treasure. It's not yours, right? I'm generous with all of those things so that no one has a need. Purity, not living a dishonest life. Repenting if you are. Not being afraid to get around other believers and say, hey, you know what? I'm dealing with something. I need to repent. I need you to pray with me. See, that shows strength. See, weakness is hiding. Strength is confiding in somebody else and saying, I need you to pray for me, brother or sister. I'm going with it. I want to repent. Help me repent. Pray with me so I can, so I can give this to the Lord. I, I need you to help me, brother or sister. And integrity, it's a place of integrity where we're not, we're not lying. We're not trying to cheat other people. Like what's yours is mine. Like, no, 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 no. What's mine is God's. And so what we see here in this move, because there's a high level of purity, integrity, and generosity, God is healing, saving, and delivering. So we have generosity. We bring generosity, purity, and integrity. God starts healing, saving, and delivering. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but that's what I want to see. I want to see salvation people getting delivered. I want to see people getting healed. Well, we got to be generous. Walk in a, walk with the the right walk, a pure walk and, and lead our life with integrity. And I want you to also know this. We're watching here in Acts. There's healing. We saw Jesus healed and he said, you're going to do even greater works than me. The apostles are healing. We look through all church history, there's healing. We should never deny the power of God. We should never, as a church, ever deny the power of God. Don't ever deny the power of God. Because, right? listen, it takes great faith for us to see the power of God. Did you know that? And guess what? Great faith will look strange sometimes. Right? <laughs> When people step out in great faith, it looks weird to other people. But we have to have great faith to see a powerful move of God. I want you to know this. If you're going to step out in great faith, you might look a little strange. But Jesus isn't strange. God isn't strange. The Holy Spirit isn't strange. I also want you to know this too, when we talk about healing, that you are not responsible for somebody else's healing. God is the one who does the healing. You are responsible for loving them. So when someone told me this, man, this has been, I don't know, I was a brand new Christian and I was a little afraid to pray for someone for healing because I thought, what if they don't get healed? Like, what if I lay hands on this person and they don't get healed? And the person told me, a more senior saint said, "Um, uh, why are you worried about that? I'm like, well, I mean, I don't want to disappoint them and all this stuff. And he's like, no, I think you're just being prideful. I'm like, why are you? That's not very nice to say. Like, why are you saying that? Yeah. And he's like, no, you're thinking about you. Why are you thinking about you? That's pride. You're thinking about you. Your job is just to pray and be obedient. God is the one who brings the healing. And whether God heals right then or a week later or 10 weeks later or, or in, when he takes him to heaven, like what, whatever. Like, I mean, but your job is to be obedient. If God calls you to pray for somebody, you go pray for them. 
It is a sin for you to say, no, I don't want to go because I'm scared. That, that, now, that's a different story. And so it is our responsibility to pray for people who want to receive healing of any kind. That's why we should not be scared to pray for people. Pray with people. But also remember, when you're praying with people, you're also supposed to love them too. And just one last thing about praying with people. Uh, if, if, if someone wants, they need healing in their heart or their body, um, I think a good question to ask them beforehand is, uh, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe God can heal you? Do you believe God wants to heal you? There's faith, right? You got to start there, right? And then you pray and let God do what God wants to do after that, right? Okay? So don't be scared to pray with somebody. Pray, pray, pray. I'm going to end with this last thought, okay? Um, we've watched so far in Acts the church grow, right? 120, 3,000, 5,000. And I don't know about you all, if y'all have read Acts a lot, I've read, I love Acts. And the reason, one of the, probably the main reason I like to read the book of Acts is it reminds me of, oh my gosh, 15, 17 years ago when God gave me a vision and showed me something. It was a picture. And I didn't know what it was, but it was a picture of a room. Some of y'all have heard this story before. I'm going to go ahead and tell it again if you've you've not heard it again. I was in the middle of a sermon. I was preaching. Maybe been preaching for maybe a year. I don't even know if I've been preaching a year yet. Mid-sermon, God gives me this this vision. I I just kind of blinked my eyes. I had to keep on preaching. I had to pause for probably 10 seconds. And I kept preaching, and I told Meredith afterwards, God, did you see that? I said, Mary, you know that, that time I paused in the middle of that sermon? She was like, yeah, it was really weird. Are you okay? And I was like, yeah. Like, the Lord gave me this vision, and I explained it to her, like vivid color and everything. I said, like, what does that even mean? And so I explained it to her. It was like this room. Um, it had black carpet. It had, like, like chairs kind of set out like this. It had a brown thing up at the top here, and it was dark, and there's lights, like, right there. And the place was packed. There was people everywhere. There was people everywhere. People everywhere. And the Lord showed me that preaching the word, like there, there's going to be people filled with the altars. There's the altars just going to be filled. And so that, that was like, that was probably almost 20 years ago. Okay? So when we came here to Sykeston and became the pastors here at the church, Mother's Day after COVID, when we were in COVID, y'all remember that? We were COVID. We came back on Mother's Day. We had just put the carpet down. Do y'all remember that? So we've been here maybe three months, I think. And then COVID happened. I think we were here three months and COVID happened. And then we came back on Mother's Day. First sermon, I was preaching on Hannah. You remember that? I get up here and I turn around. And there was people and the lights. It was the exact same thing that I saw. At that point, it's probably 15 years before that. I, I was in the very moment. It's like, whoa, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. God showed me that 15 years ago and just said, be obedient. Just trust me. Don't get impatient. Don't get antsy. I got a plan for you. That vision I'm showing you, it's going to come. 15 years went by. <laughs> It wasn't easy to stay patient. (laughs) Church people can be mean sometimes. (laughs) The road was tough to get here. But we've seen God move. The last four and a half years, she's crying, don't look at me. Um, What we've seen God do, we knew it was going to happen sooner or later. We didn't know when. But the day I turned around and saw that, I told her, I was like, this is it, babe. This is where we're supposed to be. Put a flag down. This is exactly what God has spoken. This is it. We, everything he, for 15 years, he took us through training, the bumps, the tough times and all that to get us to this very point right now. And now our ministry will start. We've been in ministry for a long time. But now the ministry is going to start. And I believe it's because we said... I believe it's because we said, what's mine is God's. Not even my dream, 
not even my plans. That's none of that's mine. God, whatever it is, whatever it is you want to do, we'll go. I don't care. You, you tell us where to go, we'll go. We're just going to love the people wherever we're at. And so we've just tried to do that ever since he showed me that vision to this day, and we'll keep doing it till the day he takes our last breath away. And we're just going to love the Lord and say, Father, it's all yours. Whatever you want to do, it's fine. Right? And so my encouragement to you tonight was just this. Just give it all to him and be patient. I mean, he's faithful. He's faithful. And if you'll just draw near to him, lean into him and trust him, he'll take you down some roads, but he'll take you to a place that you've been waiting for, that you, know he was gonna, you knew he was going to take you there. But you just stay focused on Jesus the whole time and serve him and love him and love the people around you. And just say, you know what? I'm not going to get worried about things today because it's all his anyways. I'm just going to give it all to him and trust him in everything that I do. Amen.